Hey, hey, everybody. It's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And for the most part, the market is going in the right direction. XRP has been one of the leaders in the last few hours. They are with double digit gains along with Cardano, ADA, Hex, IOTA, Zilliqa, Nexo is really strong. All of those are in the top 75 by market cap. And with those double digit gains, Bitcoin has been coming back a little bit on its domination. It's at 63.6%. .6%. And what that means is with a $540 billion market cap as a whole, there is a solid amount of inflows going into these altcoins. Yesterday, I want to tell you a little bit of what I did. I spent most of the day, as I have done for the past few Saturdays, working with kids who have returned back to Japan from living abroad. The ages are anywhere from 10 years old to 15 years old. And they're preparing for these entrance exams into the international schools throughout the country. Some of these um, Preparations were done in person that I did, and some of them were done by Zoom. I'm helping them get their skills honed for the English interview portion of their exams. And some of them are so off kilter because they have left the country that they were born in uh, at such a young age, they don't even know Japan. So it is really fun to help them in their transition. Uh, this is what I received, however, on my phone in the middle of one of those, <laughs> in one of those um, preparations. It was an SEC alert, and it was an alert that Ripple was going to sell some of their shares. They are taking $40 million in profit from their original $50 million MoneyGram investment. That is a 80% gain in 17 months. So 4 million shares will be sold through an unknown uh, or an unnamed bank right now of the 12 million shares that they have held. And they still remain as a significant shareholder. But I think there is one big lesson here. And it's something that I often say, and that is never be afraid to take profit and don't be greedy. It is really advice that I think is worth listening to. Now I'm going to jump to Singapore because Singapore is really leading the world in crypto. And we all know that Standard Chartered Bank, the financial giant headquartered in London through its Singapore-based venture arm, is building a crypto custody for the institutional investor. And also DBS, that is Singapore's largest bank. They are doing the same, along with also building a digital exchange. And go, they're going to offer security tokens. This is where you can digitize anything that is from real estate to even esports teams. And this is the team that is from SBI. It's an esports team. These are the team players and they are really cute. If you follow them on their Twitter feeds, they are following the digital asset XRP in a big way because that is how their salary is being paid. They're being paid in XRP. Now I wanna show you, this is Pinky down here on the bottom middle and he has recently uploaded a picture of his chair. <laughs> that is some chair. I think it's really fun to follow their progress. Now back to Singapore. This is UOB. They're the third largest bank in Singapore and they posted a position for a crypto security administrator. This full-time position at the United Overseas Bank, which is very strong in the Asia Pacific region, it's been so for about 80 years. Well, the position is going to actually manage the crypto keys. So this space is changing so fast. 
I found a real gem today. This is an interview that was done a couple of weeks ago, but it was just uploaded in the last 24 hours, and it's with the general manager, Ashish Birla. He's the GM of RippleNet. And don't forget, he's always in search for the perfect chocolate chip cookie. I want to tell him, just use the recipe on the back of the Toll House chocolate chips package because that is a really good recipe. But allow me to play two portions of the discussion that he had with Peter Renton of Lendit Fintech because you're going to see, well, that there is just a lot going on with the digital asset XRP. Here is this portion here. Yeah, great, uh, great question. So, you know, the way that money moves today real quickly is really 80% of cross-border flows go through three mega banks. That's HSBC, that's Citibank, that's uh, JP Morgan. And you trust those banks to move money for you. I mean, it's, it's you know, they, they are the world leaders in, in really trust. And what's what's interesting about the way that Ripple uh, started creating an alternative is that instead of trusting those financial institutions, why don't we link up smaller financial institutions and, you know, in the future, maybe even corporations directly? And instead of trusting the banks to move money, why don't we trust the blockchain to move money cross borders? And so today, correspondent banks, if you want to move money into Mexico, they actually open an account in Mexico, they preposition pesos, and they move money that way using something called mostly the SWIFT network. Right. But today, you can move digital assets into the country real time, and they get converted into local currency using cryptocurrency exchanges. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we started that journey years ago. We, we launched... Uh, the cryptocurrency addition to RippleNet about two years ago. Today, MoneyGram is using that product. You know, we have companies like Via Americas uh, in the United States, a you know a top five global remitter into Mexico from the U.S. Osmo in in Europe. Uh, in fact, the traction has been so good that uh, you know ten percent of U.S. dollar to Mexico, which is the largest corridor in the world for remittances. 10% of that now moves over blockchain technology, digital assets, and RippleNet. And wow. so we've made a pretty big dent in that in just a few years after launching. So this is real. People are using it. It's, it's far superior to the uh, compared to the traditional world where there's tons of excess capital prepositioned around the world just to facilitate payments, which is crazy. And right. uh, that removes a lot of that because you, now you're trusting a digital asset you're not trusting these large mega banks to move your money. Yeah, I still just don't understand why the BTC maxis don't embrace Ripple and the digital asset XRP when you've got these three mega banks who have dominated that space. And now it's being put into the hands of smaller money transmitters and financial institutions and regional banks to actually facilitate that movement and the people on the receiving side, which are migrant workers, are really receiving the benefits with more money in their pocket. So you're using blockchain, you are trusting a digital asset instead of a big mega bank. I just don't get that BTC narrative at all, at all. I'm gonna play just one portion now for you that talks about the Ripple vision. And you should listen to all 35 minutes, especially if you want to know more in depth about the Ripple lending solution, because they're getting one to two leads a day. They're underwriting uh, this themselves uh, to the Ripple co customers to start. They're doing so off their balance sheet, and they complete this uh, process with a quick risk assessment. It's it's quite interesting to, to listen to that. I am just though going to play one more 60 second portion that uh, is talking about the vision of where I think Ripple is going. Because as Ashish says, there's a lot of other white space to be had in this fintech world. You raise the bar, whereas in Singapore or the UK, you know, they've come out with clear digital asset blockchain regulation. They've, they've streamlined 
uh, how to become a fintech in those countries. I think MES in, in Singapore is doing a fabulous job with, with both. And so if you want to innovate, you know, they're going to attract companies that want to innovate just like the United States did with the internet. So it's unfortunate. And hence, like, hey, like, you know, Ripple and companies like Ripple that want to innovate in the blockchain space. I'm not so sure. And I think our CEO is also, you know, you know, have said some similar things is that it's super clear how to move forward in the United States. Right. And folks want certainty. And I think uh, that's only natural. So I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, some of the background on, on, uh, on Brad, our CEO's comments. Right, right. Okay, fair enough. So, uh, so last Brad question. I, I'd love to get your sense on, sort of, for you. on the vision for Ripple and what's coming down the track. I mean, uh, it's 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 exciting all the different things you're working on, and I could, you know, it feels like there's so many trends that seem to be kind of coming together that will help uh, Ripple. But what what is your vision? What's what's down the track for you guys? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I, I think we are going to continue to build out RippleNet. So the more customers, the more partners we have as part of, of RippleNet, that is, you know, the moat. Uh, that is really our, you know, distributing this to all the different folks around the world. I think continue to do that. We are going to continue to expand ODL on-demand liquidity. I mentioned it's in a few countries as, you know, destinations. We want to get global coverage uh, of that where possible uh, by the regulators. And then, you know, uh, lending is just one example of other products that we can offer our RippleNet customers uh, that solve real problems for them. And, uh, you know, I think there are other areas as well where, listen, you get lending down, you get payments down, uh, that opens up a lot of other, uh, you know, white space for us to innovate in as well. Uh, one in particular is e-commerce. I think with COVID, you've seen an explosion in growth of e-commerce. I don't think you have the right kind of financial infrastructure to support those kinds of companies. All right. So, yeah, I had it queued up a little bit sooner than I thought I did. So it was a little longer than that 60 seconds. But we are going to jump into the fluff now. So I will put the link to this podcast in the description below if you want to get the uh, information in its entirety. All right. What I want to talk about is a very important traditional Japanese word. This is shuhari. Shu meaning to obey, ha meaning to detach, and ri meaning to separate. And the shu is the phase of when you are learning and you do so through the instruction of a teacher or a mentor. And then ha is the time where you start to detach from your teacher or your mentor and you create your own style. It's your innovation phase. And finally, ri, which means to separate, is where you develop even further and you find your own way, your own voice your own style, what makes you different. So the fundamentals and knowledge, that never changes. Oh, Momo has a little sneeze. That never changes. This is uh, the part of when you take on any sort of art form. You are building on the traditional knowledge and fundamentals right? But as you can see in this kanji, they have gone into a new technique or a new art form. And this is the example of those three same characters. And then yet again, the three same characters, but the calligraphy is from a master of technique who has found his own way. Calligraphy is one of those really beautiful art forms that Shuhari is so evident. For example, this is a young gentleman who is famous for his calligraphy. And of course, he started with a teacher who taught him the traditional way. But now, look at his way. And another person who has found her way 
is Itsuki Miyazaki. She calls herself Mommy. She works on a very large scale with the big brush, always in a kimono. <laughs> wow, can you imagine? Because that ink is very much strong and stains. And this is this is Tomoko. Tomoko Kawao. She is someone who has really developed her own style and technique with what is called shodo or calligraphy. And she too works on a very large scale. And her style com really combines a little bit of performance. She's very fun to watch. Well, this gentleman here collaborated with Tomoko. He is insanely creative. He is programmer Kosei Ikeda. And they went to create an interesting work of art with her three meter high kanji characters. He captured her movements. You can see here that a three dimensional movement when she wrote out the kanji characters was recorded. And then they took those recordings and they created photography and it was exhibited at the Bijou Gallery in October. The event was called Traces. And there were 12 photographs created. You can see how that technical movement was then represented in this light and photographic images were then created. It's quite amazing, right? The physical movement being turned into a photograph. This is truly an example of Shuhari. All right, everybody, do find your own Shuhari. Take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.